Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics chat. After hesitating for a really long time, I finally decided to launch a Patreon for the podcast. With the war going on and me serving in the army, honestly, it has never been as difficult to produce the podcast as it is right now. And as we're heading towards the winter, it's going to become even more challenging because the Russia will probably continue its last year's tactic of striking our power plants, substations, and other energy infrastructure. So I hope that your financial support would both help me practically, but also give me a bit of extra motivation to keep producing the podcast in these circumstances. By the way, I set it up so that the payments are per episode instead of monthly. So if it happens so that I'm unable to produce episodes for a long time, uh, you won't be charged. There are also some small perks that come with the different tiers. So please check it out. Uh, the address is patreon.com slash buy info chat and you can find the link in the show notes or on the website and if you do decide to join that would really mean a lot to me okay now a bit of news from ukraine there was no shortage of airstrikes since the last episode one of them affected me personally i can't really share many details about it, but I'm fine, I'm not injured or anything. What I do want to tell you about is the June airstrike on Kramatorsk, which I already talked about a couple of episodes ago. But what I didn't know at the time was that a talented Ukrainian writer and reporter, Victoria Amelina, was severely injured in that attack and died in the hospital just four days later. There's a very interesting podcast by The Guardian about Victoria. In particular, her search for a hidden diary of her fellow writer, Volodymyr Vakulenko, who was kidnapped and executed by the Russian soldiers. I'll put the link to that podcast in the show notes. And as I said, it's, it's quite interesting. I encourage you to listen to it. But here I will only include the last bit of that episode, which I found particularly moving. Victoria's death leaves behind her husband and her son. How did it feel when you found out that she'd gone? Um... Well, this isn't about me. And the fact is that a lot of people were terribly, terribly devastated and furious, you know. Mm. I think for myself, because I'm a cultural journalist and I've sort of stumbled into writing about Ukraine, I hadn't really taken into consideration that I would become friends with somebody and then they would die. I mean, even though that makes no sense because it's a war, people die all the time. So I felt what a huge loss she was because, you know, her literary career was just beginning to really blossom. She had so many books to write. She was such an asset to Ukraine, actually, in all the work she was doing around uh, civil liberties, justice, war crimes... She was an excellent woman, and I felt absolutely distraught when I discovered that she died. Please join me for a moment of silence for Victoria Melina, Volodymyr Vakulenko, and many other talented Ukrainians murdered by Russia.
Slovo Ukrajine. And now let's talk about bioinformatics. My guest today is David Dillis. David is a senior scientist at Rush now, but in this episode we're talking about the work he did while being a postdoc at the University of Lausanne. This work is called Read the Tree, and it's a tool for inferring phylogenetic trees from raw reeds. So I asked David how he became interested in phylogenetics. So when I was doing my um, PhD thesis, um, I was working at the University College of uh, London um, with Paula Oliveri and on, on brittle stars and the evolution of gene regulatory networks. And there we found that there is a specific gene um, that was required in order to initiate uh, the, the construction of um, a larval skeleton. And in order to prove that really we are talking the this about the same gene in two species that have shared a last common ancestor 500 million years ago, um, we needed to build a phylogenetic tree. So that was the first time that I got around this and it really made me interested in, you know, okay, how can we really figure out whether two genes are actually the same that we are talking about, you know, whether we are actually talking about the relationship between species in a particular way. So that's how I kind of got uh, exposed to phylogenetic trees and that's why I also wanted to pursue it further. Mm -hmm. And so when you started this postdoc at the University of Lausanne, did you start it specifically with the intention of um, looking into phylogenetic trees? Yes, that's correct. So um, I started my, my postdoc to, um, in, initially we wanted to build something completely different. We wanted to build like a, a tree binning method where you would build individual phylogenetic trees, not for species, but for for uh, for uh, groups of genes and then see how you can uh, bind them together to build a species tree but we kind of quickly got into a completely different path by being introduced by the by our collaborator uh, Fritz Sedlacek to his um, he developed a method for for mapping long reads uh, to to sequences and from that moment on I kind of started to ah, okay maybe we can use this method to to speed up the construction of phylogenetic trees because this was always something that was um, a bit cumbersome if you wanted to build if you want to build an extremely good phylogenetic tree you would need to use um, a lot of species so a good uh, a sampling um, a lot of genes because you need to have a lot of genes so you need to have an extremely long multiple sequence alignment and then um, and then comes the crazy part you can use extremely fast methods that are unreliable uh, not, they are reliable but uh, not to the same uh, a degree of precision or you can use like Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian methods that are extremely um, good and give you an extremely nice sampling of the whole uh, space of phylogenetic trees but they are extremely slow right so I was thinking okay maybe these two things I, I, it's kind of like hard to change because they are extremely well established but what if we come up with a faster way of actually getting the input data ready for these methods right so that's where where the whole idea then of root to tree come from uh, came from where we were thinking okay you know to to build a tree what we need to do is actually we need to go get samples we need to sequence them then we need to take the reads and 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 filter them then we need to um build an assembly then we need to annotate them we need to um a, a, a compute some orthology in which we compare um you know all the genes that we extracted against all the other genes from other species in order to then later build the alignment and so on and so forth where all these steps take an, an in cr crazy amount of time right so we thought about what could, if we could sidestep all the steps by using a mapping approach and then speed up the whole process and then very quickly or immediately start with you know the in inference of the phylogenetic trees right so this was the whole idea of this project and so when you when you say that these steps take a lot of time i think and correct me if i'm wrong but uh, there are actually like two kinds of of times that we're talking about it's like uh, human time for someone to sit down and write the pipeline and you know download install different tools figure out like how to run them and and then there's actual computer time to run the programs that's that's absolutely correct right so if you think about the multi step process you can either build a, an extremely nice pipeline you know with with tools like snake snake make or nextflow or, or whatever right and and then it will work but you need to work out you know for 
For Illumina reads, I need a different assembly method that I need for Oxford Nanopore reads or for PacBio reads, right? So you have to account for all these factors. Also, quality control works differently for all of these methods. And then later, maybe once you have an assembly, okay, annotation, maybe then you can use, you know, Augustus or something like this to annotate and, and do some protein predictions. And from that moment on, again, once you have the proteins and the genes, then you can use an orthology prediction tool that will, you know, group the genes that you inferred into into buckets of genes that we already know. So that's kind of like, you know, we would know, okay, this is this is that gene that belongs to this group of gene. And this computation, so this all these steps um, take a lot of human time to figure out, you know, which tools to use, what is currently the best tool as well, right? We have tons of benchmarking papers available to check for those and then to set it all up and then to make it work, right? So you have, would have to do this for each species separately, for each technology separately, uh, and then finally, you know, also the computation time is massive, right? If you if you want to do an all versus all computation where you have uh, 30,000 genes and you want to compare it to, let's say, 20 species where each species has 30,000 uh, genes, the complexity explodes, right? So you would have to use a high performance uh, cluster and, 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 and make all these computations happen so that you actually get to a point where you can infer a phylogenetic tree, right? So that's, that's, uh, and this computation time is extremely computationally intensive, right? Maybe, you know, nowadays assemblies and so on, the steps can be done quite quickly, depending on the tool and the precision that you're aiming for. But then, like, once you get to the point where you have to infer or homology and orthology, then it becomes extremely computationally uh, expensive, right? So that would be then the other aspect that you mentioned. You kind of gave us a breakdown of the different steps that you have to go through when building a phylogenetic tree, uh, but let's maybe spend a bit more time on that and discuss like each step, why is it necessary? So can't you simply do like multiple sequence alignment and build a phylogenetic tree on that? Or like, can you talk about why you need those extra steps like um, protein prediction, like annotation? What what do they actually do and what do they contribute? So if you have a genome, right? Um, and let's think like, you know, you have a, a genome of a, of a human and of an ape, right? A multiple sequence alignment will will be extremely difficult because you know it's the genes are not placed in the in the right place and the things that you can actually align uh, extremely well to each other are genes right they are similar to each other uh, the rest of the of the genome the the non-coding regions I, I think that that will be extremely difficult to align if not even impossible um, um, to align correctly right so you would have you can imagine you have like stretches where the genes are placed in different locations right so how would you kind of like put this all together right you would kind of have to figure out so that's why usually when we construct phylogenetic trees we actually um we first want to know which are the genes that are homologous across the species for which we want to construct the phylogenetic tree with right that's why we do this you know orthology prediction homology uh, inference and that would just basically take out the genes and then okay i know okay this is one gene family and then I do an alignment of that particular gene family, right? And then I do it for all the gene families for which I find, uh, you know, um, uh, close genes in the genome with. And then I have a lot of those and I concatenate them. And this is this is then my input matrix. The alignment, the, the alignments of all these individual genes from the genome, right? So otherwise it would be extremely difficult to, um, to do it if not impossible, depending on, you know, how distant the species are and so on and so forth. So that's the step that uh, you call annotation, right? And and then uh, there is the uh, protein prediction. So do you have to um, sort of translate the nucleotide sequence to the amino acid sequence? What, what does that accomplish? So that's correct, right? So if you have a genome... Um, then you know there are, there are, um, usually you know we have in, in the genome we have exons right so we want to figure out you know which are the start and ending point of exons and and if we put them all together then we have a, a consistent protein right that has different isoforms um, and that's exactly so the protein prediction would kind of like go through the genome and check 
using some like maybe pre-trained model you know okay which are the, the sequences that i know of oh this is this looks like an interesting part so it would cut it out and it would stitch it together and kind of form um, a prudium prediction so I, i'm not an expert in this methods uh, i have to say right uh, it, it might be like this is a, a quite an intuitive explanation that uh, i bet that there are much more intricacies and and you know more um, uh, sophisticated steps in there but basically that's how you kind of want to get this you know s sequence stretches that represent a, a whole gene and that can be translated into a consistent protein where you don't have like a, a stop codon in the center or something like this right Okay, but like, why is it important? Is it because the axons are thought to be under more evolutionary pressure and so there is more signal there as opposed to like introns that, you know, may mutate uh, more chaotically? That's correct. I, I think that's kind of a lot of the, then in the, in the step ver at the very end, right? When we, when we want to infer phylogenetic trees, right? We need to we need to, again, use some type of evolutionary model that describes, you know, probabilities of uh, things switching, right? This is also something to do with, like, synonymous changes or non-synonymous changes if you make a, a DNA model. And with protein models, then, you, again, you have, you know, probabilities of a protein, you know, uh, uh, with a certain degree will to change to another, like an amino acid, sorry, to change into another amino acid uh, in a protein, right? So you would model this type of, you know, uh, probabilities of change, and you would use these probabilities in, in order to infer then later on the phylogenetic tree, right? Okay, that makes sense. And so you were a little bit annoyed with the complexity of this whole pipeline. And so what, what were your thoughts? Like, what did you decide to uh, simplify or to throw away? So that's exactly so. Here's the 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 thing. In the beginning, it's kind of annoying, but it's also kind of fun, right? To do all these different steps because you learn a lot about the intrinsicities of building a genome and annotating and predicting proteins and all these things. So it's it, it's kind of cool. But I was thinking, what if you know somebody uh, has a lot of sequences from species and doesn't have the time to do that or, or you know would really quickly need to understand what's happening there like in the case of, of covid right so in that case um we decided to to do something where um you would need two sources of inputs so one is um the the raw sequencing reach which would come which can come from any technology and the other uh, input that you would need is already um, um, a predefined orthologous group. So these are gene families where, you know, we have, uh, for instance, for like some um, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase, which is uh, one big gene family, would have, you know, all the genes that we find in different species that are capable of doing that, right? And we would use these gene families for some species that we pre-select as input, right? So in, in the example, um, in the paper, um, what we are doing is we take a 30 species in the in the um, in the in the tree of life in the metazone tree of life with uh, different animals you know ranging from human mouse um, to also sea urchins and even more distant species so we we take these and and then we try we have all the species in that list but we don't have the mouse species and we try to map that mouse species in there and then we can use this in order to check how accurately we are mapping right because we know where the mouse is placed in that tree it's placed next to the rat right so that's kind of like the first experiment that we did right in in this in this uh, in, in the paper by taking only raw sequencing read you know we know the phylogeny so we take the gene families from it and then we just uh, uh, make a mapping step that uh, puts the reads against the different genes and reconstructs your sequences from it and we use this as an input for the tree inference and then we check how good is our tree you know is it the same as it was before or is it different right and we vary certain parameters to really make sure that we you know touch the edges of what's possible with a tool like this so you mentioned uh, orthologous groups can you talk in some more detail what they are and where do they come from okay so orthologous groups this is when i every time when i mention like a gene family right it's a more general term for an orthologous group right so you know we animals share a lot of genes that we have in common some genes are extremely um, important because these genes, you know, define some basic developmental mechanisms, for instance, right? So if you would look for a specific for this specific gene across, for instance, all the mammals, you would find that 
all these mammals share that particular uh, uh, gene, right? Um, and this, uh, to kind of computationally find them, we use, uh, you know, ortholog um, uh, inference algorithms uh, to this. And this group, you know, of, of if you put all the different species together that share that exact same gene, that group would be called an orthologous group, right? So they are, uh, or the genes are orthologs to each other, right? Um it, it, it's there is a little bit there's a bit more a fine grained definition to this, right? And 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 there are some nice uh, YouTube videos that that you can look up to where you can find a bit more in depth explanation to this. But it's basically for in in simple terms, it's kind of like a gene family, you know, where you look for the same gene across many different species and you put them together, and that's what we define an orthologous group. Okay, but uh, computationally inside a computer, is that like a single consensus sequence or is it like many sequences that represent the variants of this gene? How is it represented? So in, in the computer, we represent it as um, a, a set of sequences, right? So there are many sequences together. And when you build a multiple sequence alignment, you will see long stretches of things that are, ex that are exactly the same and then some, um, you know, mutations or some... Uh, some deletions or insertions in, in uh, depending on the species, right? But the basic functionality of that uh, of that gene will be uh, extremely similar. And for our tool, we don't use a single consensus sequence. We actually use all the sequences for the species that we pre-select. This kind of implies that you have a little bit of a prior knowledge of what you are actually sequencing there, right? So if you know, if I go into the field and I find like a, a thing that looks like a bee. Right, and I, I don't know the species, right? But I would be extremely interested in, you know, to which is the closest B that this represents to. I would go to the um, orthologous matrix browser um, that my boss developed. I would select, you know, a lot of B species from there, and maybe a couple of flies or something like this to have a nice outgroup. And then I would use this as an input data set, right? And then I would take that sample that I collected uh, uh, from the B, you know, sequence it and, 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 and get the reads. And I would use these two input sources and see where this, this uh, B is actually placed in the phylogenetic tree. Let's uh, take your B example. I, I like that example. So you would go to the orthologous ma matrix. Maybe, maybe uh, talk a little bit about what, what that is, that resource. Uh, yeah, that's, so this is, this is an, a, a database um, that has extremely accurate um, um, uh, pre-computed orthologous groups, right? So, for instance, if you are looking for a specific gene and you want to understand which other species have that particular gene, in the orthologous matrix browser, you will find that information. And you will also find information about, for instance, you know, um, whether that gene, you know, has independently duplicated in a specific species or not, um, you know, where is it present and where is it absent? Is there another gene with a similar function? All this type of information you can find in that in that orthologous matrix browser um, web web resource. Yeah. And so, what what would happen if the gene was duplicated in a species? You would have like two different orthologous groups with a very similar sequence or something? So that's, that's now it gets a little bit tricky, right? <laughs> that's, that's now the interesting part. So if you have a duplication, um, then you have um, from the same gene a, a, ex, a very similar um, 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 gene, right? Uh, and then you would have to... So there are methods where you can kind of build... That's something that we call um, hierarchical orthologous groups, HOGs. Right, where you would store this information, where you could then look up um, whether, you know, for a gene of your interest, you have many duplications in, in a particular species. Right, because you can imagine, for instance, we might have a single copy of that gene, but maybe the ape has two copies of that gene. And then, you know, there's, there's also a bit of debate of, you know, whether the a paralogous gene can take over the gene function. So you could imagine an experiment where you know you know you knock out the original gene and you leave that paralog mm -hmm, there, right? Mm -hmm. The duplicated gene will it just take over the functionality from the gene before, or will it not? You know what's what's happening. So, it, but it's it's this is quite difficult. For our tool, what we try to use is kind of um, 
only the single copy orthologs, so the genes that most likely are connected to each other. So if you imagine, you know, you would put them in a network, it's a tightly connected network where, you know, the the, dif- the distances between that one gene from that one species to all the other species of that have that same gene are extremely tight-knit and close together, right? So that would be the input that we would use for, for, for read to tree. So in your B example, you would go to the um, orthologic matrix website, you would download those orthologous groups, and uh, you would sequence some DNA from your B that you're interested in, right? If you wanted to build a tree, so you would need other species as well. Would you have to go get some real samples too, or can you use maybe some reference genomes? So that's the thing. From the orthologous matrix browser, we already get the references, right? Oh, because okay. we selected some some bees from there as well, right? So we get already the references and we get them already in the stage that we need them to be in order for us later to do the tree inference, right? So your tool would get enough information to automatically have like uh, phylogenetic tree leaves for those species that you selected and is only the new leaf with your sequence trees that would have to be placed in that tree. Exactly, exactly. So in so this uh, for that particular uh, scenario that works quite well and we shown in that in the paper that you know if we then take for instance you know if we try to play is a b within another b that's extremely simple task because the reference data sets are very close to each other, right? So it would very quickly find nice things to match the reads on. But now think, actually, we have a bee, but, you know, the closest next species would be a mouse, right? That's quite distance uh, already, right? Would we be able to place still the bee, you know, in, in the correct position in that tree? And we have shown in that paper that we can do that quite accurately up to, um, like, maybe 500 million years of distance, right? So even if the species is extremely distant, we can still use the genetic information from the orthologous groups on from the reads that we have to place a species quite accurately into the tree, right? And this is quite cool. And we compare it with an assembly-based approach using similar thing. And we see that um, our tool is doing a, a, a similar or slightly better job than, than the standard approach. And to be clear, your tool by itself does not infer those distances right or topologies you actually call to a like third party tool uh to to do that stuff but the Absolutely. difference is in the inputs to that exactly. tool exactly that's correct that's correct so we we kind of make this step faster to get to the input you also had a um an example with with the covid virus right with sars cov2 and uh so let's say we are in 2019, 2020, when COVID just emerged, and we don't have any orthologous groups for COVID, right? We uh, like we're de- dealing with a new virus. Are there entries in the orthologic matrix for um, other kind of viruses for uh, coronaviruses? Yes, yes, that's correct. That's correct. So we have um, entries in the, there is actually a, a separate instance, which is a virus specific instance of this uh, orthology matrix browser. And um, uh, in that paper, we also kind of reconstructed uh, the phylogenetic tree using references that were, I, I don't think COVID. So there were other viruses, you know, respiratory viruses that we used. And there, what we did is, you know, you take a, a backbone of of, of uh, reference viruses, and you take many many different sequence reads from many many strains that you sampled from 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 humans, right? And you map them uh, all of them. You construct a multiple sequence alignment. And now, when we build the tree, we actually see that we can accurately you know, discover in this tree the right um, variants that we also saw, right? So, you know, we had an alpha variant, an an omega variant, a delta variant, all these things we can see, right, if we do that. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily need to have, you know, a COVID virus as a reference in your your backbone, um, and you will still, you know, do a a good job of of getting the right tree. That's amazing. And so... The saved human time, like work time, is is obvious because you don't have to go through, uh, you know, writing a pipeline. Your tool is essentially a pipeline, right? You you just give it 
inputs and it calls the right tools and it gives you the output. Uh, but what is in your experience the saved computer time? Like how much faster is, is your tool than the sort of standard pipelines? So we so we tested a lot of different parameters, right? Like, you know, how many reference species you have, um, um, what's the read coverage that you have, and so on and so forth. And in, in the paper, I, I did a um, um, computational assessment of the the time savings that we can have, and, and it's 10 to 100-fold faster to get the tree, you know, using our method, where you can imagine, you know, all the uh, steps before we start the phylog uh, you know the phylogeny inference are are the ones that are computationally intensive right so i compare those steps and and it turns out that you know depending on the um, you know the read origin whether it's transcriptomic or genomic the technology the coverage level and the the distance to the closest neighbor in the backbone all these parameters are assessed and using all these parameters we see that we you know consistently are 10 to 100 fold faster than than what is out there and in absolute numbers, how long does it like? Is it minutes or hours or days? So okay, <laughs> it's a, it's a, again a, a tricky question, right? Let's uh, let's say um, you have uh, a ten x um, a b, right? Um, and you have maybe let's say fifteen species uh, that you want to map it to. Uh, it might take an hour or something like this to run on 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 a regular computer. Right, because what it would do, it would go, you know, from from uh, it would map the reads to all the fifth all the genes that you have in this fifteen reference species, and then and then uh, uh, give you the output matrix, and the tree will direct the 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 read to tree tool will directly also use um, uh, IQ tree at the end to 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 give you a first uh, phylogenetic tree, right? But you will have the multiple sequence alignment as well um, to do your own assessment. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And how would you say that time is split uh, between the preparatory phases uh, and, and the actual tree inference? So the pipeline, IQ tree is extremely fast. So the pipeline takes longer than what IQ tree does. Yes. So I, so my pipeline would take, if it's like a short, um, you know, 15 species and we map one species on it, it would take maybe like half an hour on my tool. Uh, um, dep again, that depends on a lot of different parameters, right? And then IQ tree uh, on on an extremely fast setting would take maybe five minutes to give you a, a, a tree without bootstrapping. So without you know giving you a confidence whether a you know for a sp specific split in the tree, right? So IQ tree, what paradigm does it belong to? So from what I remember, there are like Bayesian tools and maximum likelihood tools. Maximum and likelihood. Other. Okay. It's a maximum likelihood, and it's uh, it's it's. I, I think it's a really, really, really cool uh, phylogenetic inference tool because it's fast and the trees actually look look quite accurate, right? So it, it it does an amazing job and it's very well maintained and developed. It's a really cool tool. Okay, awesome. So now that we've discussed this from uh, a user perspective, let's now move to your perspective, the developer perspective, right? How does read to tree actually like work? Under the hood. Okay, so um, what what we basically do is we use the fact that we have the orthologous groups and 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 the capabilities of the OMA browser to reobtain the exact DNA sequences for the protein sequences um, that we downloaded, and with the DNA sequences, it, this allows us then to you know take the reads that we have and map them against the DNA sequences. Like you have kind of like an artificial genome, if you if you if you would like. Why do you start with protein sequences? So okay, this is an intrinsicity of the of the OMA browser, right? If you download um, orthologous groups, you get uh, the things that you get downloaded is protein sequences because that's what we use as an input to build phylogenetic trees. We don't use the DNA sequence; we use the protein sequence. So like the data you obtain from the um, orthology matrix resource are protein sequences. Exactly, exactly. And because you have raw reads, which are uh, nucleotide reads, yeah. you have to like get them to a common denominator. Exactly, exactly. So that's why, and the cool thing is, you know, so you have the protein sequences, but you also have the corresponding DNA sequence. So if I build an alignment, right, of the protein sequence, which is uh, which is an easier task to do because, you know, they're on the protein level much higher conserved than on a DNA level, 
uh, then later on, when I map to the DNA, it's much easier for me to place the sequence in that alignment because I pre-build it using the protein sequences, right? So it kind of, it makes this task much faster. So I don't have to recompute an alignment. I just have to place it back, right, in, in, in what I already have because I have the DNA and the protein sequences. And, and for the mapping step, so you take the reads, you know, the, the, the nucleotide uh, reads and you use uh, this tool that uh, Fritz Sadacek developed which is called next gen map and that maps the the, uh, the reads against the DNA sequences and now you have two things that you have to solve one is um, that I have the DNA sequences for one gene but for multiple se- uh, species so which one do I choose as being the best representative for the species that I try to place into the phylogenetic tree this is one issue so you have to, there I define some type of metric in order to decide which would be the best representative. So is, is that done for each read separately? No, so this is done after all the reads are mapped, right? So you have all the reads mapped. So I have a, um, a like a, a, a file that, that tells me for each nucleotide position, uh, given the reference, I know the, the nucleotides where they are. And then, and then I take uh, from there. I have to decide. Okay, you know, is that is that a good a good representation? Because you know, when I map the reads against the reference at at the same location, I can have you know many. If, if the location is, for instance, an A, I can have many A's, but maybe one is a T, or maybe I have a fifty fifty thing or a fifty forty. So I have to use some like. Uh, 60 40 or i have to use some type of metric to decide okay at this position i have a, a acgt right which which nucleotide to choose from yeah so you have like actually many references right it's not not just so you map all the reads against all the references exactly exactly and then it's a matter of choice right so i think the 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 reason why retro tree performs so well is because the metrics how we choose then later on the right representative sequence for our species you know, they work quite well, right? And they are extremely simple. It's just a matter of like, what is the maximum encountered uh, nucleotide at, uh, for the position? And then later on, what is the longest extracted sequence uh, that we find, right? Uh, because we have the many references. And that's how we decide uh, which sequence to choose for our for our um, species. And do, by doing that, we get quite good results. So do you do you try to you don't try to pick a single right a single winning reference but instead you construct like a new a completely new sequence exactly is that correct from your reads yes so you do sort of a per gene assembly or per no, gene mapping that's, it's 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 maybe it's something like a reference guided assembly right where you have a reference and you have the nucleotides and I use both information to extract for that gene a new gene sequence for the species that I'm trying to place. So it's, you know, it, it's not like a complete assembly. So it doesn't do, for instance, what you could think of is, you know, you bin all the sequences and then you use an assembly tool to take the bin sequences to re- reconstruct you a new sequence, right? By, by, by doing um, a, a proper assembly, whether it's a graph assembly or any other assembly method. Uh, I tried this as well, but this didn't work so well as just you know, taking the mapping and then using the mapping information to extract the, the, the right sequence for, for that particular gene. It's kind of like surprising, like the, the methodology is extremely simple, but you know, simplicity allows for speed, right? So as if you, if you have a simple way of, of getting of getting stuff done and it doesn't compromise accuracy then you know we can we can we can in- increase the computational uh, efficiency with it so do you have to pick a single reference that you use as a guide to construct your um your new consensus sequence or or, or do you look at all the references at, at the same time because the position may differ right yeah, that's uh, that's correct. So for all the references that I have, I have a, a sets of orthologous groups. Okay, so these are gene families. Let's take for example a single gene family. For that gene family, I have from every species a sequence, a DNA sequence. Yeah. So this is my gene for every species of the backbone. The length can differ, right? Exactly. The length can differ. Absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. And now what I do, I take the reads that I have and I map them against every species in that orthologous group. 
So every gene sequence in that orthologous group. So I will have, if I have 15 of those, 15 potential candidates to choose from to decide, you know, for the single species that I want to have. So then I check, you know, what is the most likely sequence that represents my species that I try to place by um, what is the best uh, coverage and by secondly, what is the longest reconstructed sequence? So how many base pairs do I find where I can have a, 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 a nucleotide placed during the mapping step, right? And these two criteria then decide, okay, actually it turns out that for that gene family, you know, when I try to place the B, um, the Drosophila, the fly sequence was much better representative um, for that gene family than actually any of the B sequences. And then I would use, you know, what I reconstruct based so the the local assembly reference guide assembly on on top of that Drosophila sequence. Right. So that that's what I meant. So you do pick like a single winning yes. uh, gene and use that as a guide. Yes, indeed. But that winning sequence can be different for different genes, right? For one gene, it could be Drosophila, and for another, it could be, I don't know, a tick. Yes, absolutely. That's correct. That's correct. That's how, you, you, right? Because you would expect, you know, so if you if I look at statistics, right, uh, from the tests that I've done, in many cases, it will pick, uh, like, for instance, if we stay at, with the B example, it will pick another B species, right, that we have. But there are cases in, in which it will actually pick a, a more distant ancestor. And if I look and compare this, it's actually representing it you know, this sequence that I reconstruct is, is better representing what you would get out from just, you know, doing an assembly, right? We do that in the paper as well. So I take the reconstructed genes that we do from this, you know, reference guided assembly approach that we do there, right, from this mapping approach, and I cross check them with, you know, what the original uh, assembly derived sequence is to check for similarity, right? And you see that actually with this approach, we are are capable of extracting gene sequences that are extremely similar to when if you would do a, a regular assembly approach, right? Are you worried though that that can introduce bias? Like if if you base your you know guided assembly on let's say Drosophila, then in the phylogenetics tree, the inferred distance to Drosophila would be shorter than you know otherwise warranted. So that's true, but we are using, you know, so in, in this paper, we recommend to use um, many orthologous groups, right? So if you go across many different orthologous groups, there might be, you know, 5% where the Drosophila was picked, but in the other 95%, you know, the B was picked, uh, 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 another species of B, right? So over, um, you know, over many orthologous groups, the bias kind of diminishes, right? And we capture nicely the variation that we expect to see in, in, in a species like that. No, but exactly. Like, I mean, okay, let's say you have another B species there. And in 95% of the time, that B species reference would be picked. And so the similarity of your new species to the B species would get pushed, you know, towards that B species. Uh, so it would appear more similar um, than, uh, than it actually is just because that B species was picked as, a, as the closest, maybe fairly picked as the closest reference, but, but still that short distance would appear even shorter because that's used as a reference. That's correct. So I, I would say... So this comes into an interesting part, right? So from a, a, a point of placement, right, where we are interested, is it the correct neighbor, we are safe. But if we are interested in how closely we are related to that closest neighbor, then it gets a bit more tricky, right? Then then this is, this. you're absolutely correct. We might, you know, the branch length between the two, that might be not as accurate as if you would do it, you know, with a standard approach, which is less biased, right? Because you are absolutely correct. In this case, you know, the backbone is providing the bias to what we will see in the phylogenetic tree. So that's that's it, right? Did, did we discuss the whole algorithm or is there anything else? No, that's, 
uh, that's it. Once it's picked, you know, we just uh, put it back into the multiple sequence alignment, and then we concatenate the different orthologous uh, group multiple sequence alignments to one big one, and that's the input for the the IQ tree um, 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 tool in the end. So, so then does the whole tool, the whole pipeline, deal only with nucleotide sequences? So the whole pipeline deals with nucleotide sequences, but at the end. You know, once I, I, I get to a point where I have the nucleotide sequence, I place it back into the protein alignment, right? So I'm making use of the knowledge that I know, you know, if the closest reference that was picked is a B, I take, you know, the conversion from, from that triplet of, of nucleotides into a protein from that particular B. Is that because IQ3 expects a protein sequence? So IQ3 can work with DNA or protein alignment, but... I think in generally in phylogenetics, if you try to resolve phylogenetic trees over a long distance, right, you would rather use protein alignment because it's easier for us to find similarity across proteins than it is across uh, DNA. Can you talk a bit about the orthology matrix? Like who maintains it? How is it built? And like, what if you wanted to extend it with, with your own species? How can you do that? Okay. So, um, so the orthologous matrix, um, so the short is OMA, uh, and it's also the OMA browser. Um, you, this is maintained by Christoph Desimo's group at the University of Lausanne. Is, is that the same group where you were? Exactly, it's the same group that I was in. And, and, this, and the individual that actually is, is maintaining it is uh, Adrian Altenhoff. He's also uh, he's the second author on that paper uh, that we're discussing. And um, what's happening, so the, uh, the OMA uh, browser and, and this whole orthologous matrix is a, is a highly accurate tool where you compute between each gene a Smith-Waterman alignment. So, you know, you, you get the global optimum alignment uh, for, between uh, two sequences, right, to construct a network. And that's kind of like how they estimate um, um, what things to put into an orthologous group by doing an all versus all. So all genes of one species against all genes of all 2,000 species that are there, right? So this is an extremely computationally expensive undertaking, right? But on the other hand, you have extremely reliable orthologous groups. And and what if you, you want to extend it for, for your own purposes? So maybe you're working purely on uh, coronaviruses and you want to build your own matrix just based on the different coronavirus uh, references. So that's possible. The algorithm is, is freely available, right? You can download it and, and you can just uh, run it yourself. It's it's also extremely easy to set up. You just need to have the, uh, the, the genes or the proteins from your uh, sequences of interest. You put them into a folder and you just run the algorithm and it just computes everything and, and gives you the orthologous uh, groups at the end. All right. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's a very cool tool. Is there anything else that uh, I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about? You know, I'm 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 quite happy that that it it took this 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 whole work took an incredible amount of time to set up, um, you know, to make all these experiments run, to make sure you know how comparable are we and and what are the edges, right? Because I'm always thinking, like you know, I like to use tools where I understand, you know. When will it break? What are like the limitations of it, right? So we try to characterize this um, as good as we as we could, right, in the paper to make sure that when people start using it, they will know. Okay, it works well for these conditions. It probably, you know, a different approach might work better for a, a different set of conditions, right? So you have this understanding that that was for me extremely important. And the second thing was that it should be easy to run, right? So it's a Python uh, tool. You you know, if you have a command line, it, it, it's really easy to set up and, and, and to just make it work, right? So this, were, this, this, this for me, are, are, are quite important things if, if you develop a tool, right? Well, David, very cool tool. Thank you for coming on the podcast and good luck on your new job. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for doing this. It's, it's really cool. I, I find this really awesome. Thanks a lot.